um, we are going to introduce our presenter. Arlene Lechner is here. She is a co-founder of Ease and a human sexuality educator in Burke, Virginia. Arlene works in the Inclusion and Disability Services Department at the Posage JCC of Northern Virginia and formerly was the program coordinator uh, for social skills classes, adaptive sports, and assistant director of Camp Kesher, a camp for ages 13 plus with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Arlene was the behavior specialist for the pilot program of Inclusive Pathways to Success. She has a BA in human development from Hofstra University and a master's in special education from George Mason. Thank you so much, Arlene, for joining us tonight. And the floor is yours. Oh, and oh, you. I do also want to welcome Hamid Munir. He is a VP of Local Unit Operations for Virginia PTA and former Northern Virginia Dir District uh, PTA director. So we want to welcome him as well. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Amanda. I am going to share my screen. And let me move that out of the way. <laughs> and as you're getting that up, I just want to verify for our um, members present that you do want to take questions as we go through and they can either raise their hand or put them in the chat and we'll help moderate as we go. Yes, please ask questions as we go, put them in the chat, raise your hand, and feel free to take pictures of slides as we go. I know you're going to be posting it, but please feel free to take pictures as well. Um, as um, Amanda said, I am Arlene Lechner and my co-founder of Ease, Melissa Hotchberg, we are both based in Northern Virginia. We both have master's in special education with 20 plus years teaching people of all abilities. We have experience in the academic, social, and recreational settings. We work with people ages 18 months to 75 year, year olds. Um, we are human sexuality educators. We are trained through Elevatus training and we are both mental health first aid certified. So just quick background, um, Melissa was running social club for teens, young adults and adults at the Poses JCC for several years. And some of the adults and teens were having relationships, but then not understanding why they didn't last or asking for information, how do I get in a relationship? Or I'm in a relationship and we wanna take it to the next level, but I don't know how. Um, so she she went on uh, research for two years, finally found Elevatus training, and she got trained. And I was running a parent networking group where parents were coming um, to the group and saying, you know, my child was getting into trouble at school for touching someone or running up and hugging someone, and they didn't understand why they were getting into trouble. Um, so Melissa twisted my arm and said, how about it? And I said, all right, let's do this. So during the pandemic, we got started. And we got a grant through the Disability Inclusive Sexual Health Network at James Madison University. And our grant has allowed us to um, write a curriculum for teens, basically from seventh grade through age 18 or seven, seventh grade to 17 years old. And then we also teach classes 18 and up. So in each one of our classes, and also when we meet with parents and staff, we do a, our group agreement because we want to make it a comfortable place for people, you know, if you're taking a class to ask questions. And if you're a parent or a staff member, you know, maybe you have questions about your child or staff members have questions about students or clients. And we feel that this just kind of gives a little, you know, lets people ask those questions. So we say we keep it confidential. What's said on Zoom stays on Zoom. I know this is being recorded. So um, all feelings and opinions are okay. We ask that people ask questions and keep comments on topic. We say that in our classes because people can get on tangents and we ask that people show respect to everyone and we listen and learn to become more informed. 
in the first few classes, we break out what each of these words mean, because you know, if you say respect, a lot of students may not understand what is respect. So we do break that out. So people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are often left out of the conversations about relationships and human sexuality. And it's important for everyone to have sex ed and advocacy skills to be able to make healthy choices, to prevent abuse, because we know the abuse rate, unfortunately, is very high with people with disabilities, and also that they see themselves as sexual beings. So it's great you're here, right? You're being proactive versus reactive, hopefully, about sex education. Talking about sex can be challenging, right? It's, you know, kind of a taboo subject, unfortunately, um, in the United States, but hopefully uh, we'll, I'll be able to give you a little bit of more comfort in talking about it. And talking about sex ed does not give permission to have sex. It actually delays people who have this education to have sex, and they also make healthier choices. Um, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities can make informed and healthy choices. Education informs people to gain confidence to have this open communication about relationships and sex with children of all ages, and it addresses barriers to discussing sex. And when we talk about sex, we don't teach the morals and values. We just teach facts and talk about facts. It's the parent's job to teach morals and values. Why teach about it? Because sexual feelings are healthy and normal, right? And it's okay to have questions and be curious. And everyone has a right to a relationship, no matter ability, sexual orientation, gender identity. Sex, hopefully, is a natural and pleasurable part of life for everyone. And it helps to understand healthy versus unhealthy relationships. So when we talk about relationships being healthy versus unhealthy, we talk about respect, um, put downs and insults are unhealthy. And we talk about laughter and fun and having a good time, having common interests consent and boundaries, which is a huge topic or a huge part of a healthy relationship. Trust and honesty versus untrustworthy and lies. How you feel, how comfortable you are versus how uncomfortable you may be. Arguing fairly and compromising versus someone who's controlling or making you fearful. Open communication and people take responsible resp are responsible for their actions versus abuse with, for emotional, physical, and sexual. So we really try and cover what a healthy relationship can look like. So what happens if you don't have these conversations? Your child may still have a sexual relationship they might seek information from uninformed sources, you know, the school bus, a locker room. They have an older sibling. Um, they may overhear conversations at school. They may not be able to advocate for him or herself or themselves. They may be afraid to ask questions or they might engage in inappropriate behaviors. They may also be confused and afraid of their body changes, especially if they're going through puberty or starting puberty and all these changes are happening and they don't know why or they don't understand. They could be abused and not know who to talk to or how to tell someone. They could become pregnant or get an STI, a sexually transmitted infection, or they might view unlawful images or pornography online, and or be involved in an unlawful or underage relationship. So there are definite barriers to talking about sexuality. 
you know, as parents, maybe we receive negative messages or maybe no messages about sex growing up. I might age myself here, but they had the book, Our Bodies, Ourselves back in the day. And maybe your parents handed you that, or maybe they left one in the bathroom, or maybe they didn't have any conversation at all. It's also difficult just to set aside your values and listen to your child, um, asking the questions. The school curriculum may not be accessible to your child and how they learn or be comprehensive enough for them to learn. There's con constant changing terminology, especially with gender and slang. Maybe you're embarrassed or afraid you might say the wrong thing at the wrong time and afraid that talking about it leads to promiscuity, which it doesn't. And maybe you're just unsure of the answers. So you say nothing. So when talking about sex, it's really important to familiarize yourself with what, what is age appropriate or nor normal. Regular childhood sexual development, CECUS is sex ed for social change. And this um, link here will send you to a document that has what it looks like for typical children typical children zero to two, I think then three to five, it goes, breaks it all down. So why is this important? Because you need to, it's important to teach to your child's age, okay? So if your child is 16, even though they might be development, developmentally learning at a younger age or, um, it, developmentally appropriate, they may be closer to a younger child, they still are going through puberty. So you still need to go through and teach them what puberty is, but teaching them on a level they can understand, if that makes sense. Or maybe you have a 10-year-old and they are doing a behavior and it's a behavior that's typical of a three-year-old. They're then you can look and see, oh, okay, so this is, you know, developmentally, this is where he's at, what he's understanding or she is understanding. Um, so taking into consideration the best way your child learns when talking about sex, the way your child may feel about the information, um, how the information may affect your child, especially if there was trauma, and then where do you have the conversations? So the car is a great place to have a conversation, right? If your child's in the car with you, you know, you don't have to look at them. They don't have to look at you. They don't know that you're embarrassed. You don't know if they're embarrassed, but it's a good place to have a conversation. Um, also watching movies and pointing out, you know, did you see consent? Do they have boundary? Is that a healthy relationship? Um, things like that, reading books, just pointing out different things. So it's not necessarily the, you know, old fashioned idea of let's sit down and have the talk. You know, it's a constant conversation that you're constantly having and adding to as they grow. So when talking about relationships and sex ed, it's important to answer with the facts. That, you know, we answer with the facts and that's it. Um, it's extremely important to verify understanding. So there's this story where Susie comes home from school one day and she says, mom, where did I come from? And the mom's like, oh my gosh, I've been dreading this. Okay, so there was a mommy and daddy and a vagina and a penis and the sperm and the egg. And the Susie's looking at her mom like, what are you talking about? And she, the mom goes on and on. And finally, she says, Susie, did I answer your question? And she said, well, 
I heard that Joey was from Syracuse and I just wanted to know where we lived before and where we came from, moved from. So verifying that understanding is really important. It's also important to find out where they heard it so you can kind of put it into context. Um, it's okay to answer later, but make sure you tell your child, I need a little time to answer this, but schedule that time to answer them so they know you're open to having conversations. It's okay to feel embarrassed. Um, when answering, use medical terminology. So, you know, if a child goes to the doctor and they hurt their elbow, they're going to say, I hurt my elbow. But if they go to the doctor and say, you know, it hurts down there, down there could mean several things. So you want to give them the words to use and the terminology um, or showing them a picture that has the terminology on it so they can point to exactly where they need to for if something happens to them or they're feeling sick or at the doctor. Remember to use also, when talking about it, to use specific language, you know, you might say, oh, I was aroused and turned on when I saw, you know, a person walking down the street or, you know, saw a hot movie um, actor, but you're not going to say I was aroused when I, you know, got some candy for doing a good job, you know? So be careful the language you use. There's a lot of um, confusion. And so you wanna make sure that you are using the specific language. Arlene, yeah. can I say one thing here? I would raise my hand, but as host, I can't. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, for those, so my child uses an augmentative and alternative communication device. Do you have any experience with the vocabulary and terminology in that realm? Because I know I've read some things in some adult AAC user groups that um, symbol sets often don't include symbols for the medical terminology that you're talking about. Do you have any experience to share in that realm? Um not necessarily with the AAC. We have um, used pictures for people to and that are labeled the exact same way that we teach. And then we just go over it so they can actually point to what they're saying. It, we have had a hard time um, finding things as well, where it's not just, you know, there's that fine line of the pecs versus the fine line of, you know, a real body part. And so, you know, sometimes it's hard to figure that out, but there are, we do have some books and things that might help to be able to point out on a piece of paper or something they can have, you know, with them so they can point out when they go to a doctor or they are eventually with a partner and need to point, you know, I want, I like to be touched here, but not here, you know, things like that. Thank you. I just, mm -hmm. I know that we've run into that issue with our child and with, with some families, you could potentially just put in the word as, um, you know, and not need a symbol depending on the child's needs. Um, but that is definitely an interesting issue issue and yeah your child's device doesn't have the word that they need to refer to it refer yeah <laughs> for sure um and always ask for additional support if you need help talking about it and when we teach and we talk about it we share common values only of consent equity and respect in relationships it's up to parents, again, to short, share morals and values. So in a comprehensive, trauma-informed um, curriculum, this these are all the topics that we teach and that every comprehensive curriculum includes. So it's consent and boundaries, gender, social skills for friendships and dating, 
appropriate touch and talk, the relationships and friendships, communication, public, private, pornography, and online safety, body parts and hygiene, caring for your body, masturbation, decision making, healthy relationships, friends to dating, dating and breaking up, sexual feelings and acts, sexual relationships, and then the STIs and birth control. So in our class, we have a mantra, and it's to help people speak up for themselves, be self-advocates, for and sexual self-advocates, because it's your body. We tell them, my body is my own, and I decide what is right for me. And we have non-speaking students who create a mantra for themselves. They work with a one-on-one -on -one or they work with their teacher and they come up with a picture of themselves and they say, they point to themselves. My body is my own and I decide what's right for me. And then we go through pictures and who is right for you, what is right for you, what exercise, what, you know, foods, things like that. All of those, you decide it's your body, your choice. And then consent. Consent, we say, is permission or agreement. And we use fries. Everyone loves French fries, right? So we start out by saying French fries. The F is freely given. No one forces you. No one is making you afraid, pays you, tries to control you. You are freely able to give or not give consent. It's reversible. You can change your mind at any time. Maybe you want to hold hands one time, but you have to ask every time because just because you hold hands one time doesn't mean that you hold hand. You can't assume every time. Informed, you learn so that you can make healthy choices. We say you have to be 100% enthusiastic to say yes. If you are unsure, even just a little, it's a no. And that goes the same way. If you ask someone, can I hug you? And they're like, well, mm, I don't know. That means no, and you should not be hugging that person. Unless until you, until or if you get the 100% enthusiastic. And then specific is the details. How do you know if you want to give consent if you don't know what the details are? If someone says, hey, do you want to get, go out on a date? And you're like, well, is it just us? Where are we going? Are you going to pay? Am I paying? Is a parent going to bring us? Are we going on a double date? You want to find out all the information before you decide whether or not you want to give consent. And in time, I'm not going to show this video because I don't know that I have enough time to do this, but amaze.org is a website that has a ton of videos on everything from puberty to STIs and pregnancy and um, being safe in relationships. They are all cartoons. Some of them are better than others. Some of them are a little abstract and hard to make that connection to the um, topic. So I would recommend watching the video as a parent would anyway, um, before showing it to your child. This is the bear consent and communication video at www.amaze.org. And it's a really, it's a good way of showing kids of all ages about consent. When we talk about relationships and boundaries, we use the circle of relationships. Um, so you, you are in the middle or in the middle and then the white parts are boundaries, right? So the further you get away from you, the bigger the boundary. And we talk about boundaries in terms of touch, in terms of greeting, in terms of, um, touch, greeting, and then um, 
also what information you share. So the closer the person is and the smaller the boundary, the closer the touch, the more you share, the more you might trust, you trust them more. So we talk, we spend, starting on week two in our classes, we spend all of the rest of our classes going, relating to this circle of relationships and boundaries. And a great way to um, have a child sort of be able to connect this to them to their own life is to break out each circle and then they will be able to you know show a picture of you know a stranger could be someone in the grocery store an acquaintance could be a neighbor someone who walks their dog in the neighborhood right classmates co-workers and teachers you know who are friends a lot of times people our kids think you know a friend is everyone you know, but not everyone is a friend. And so distinguishing who their friends are in their life can be a really big um, help to them. And boundaries, we de define as what is okay and not okay. We talk about the phys emotional, physical, and online. What is comfortable versus uncomfortable. So they're not... There's a woman, Kelly Maller, who Mailer talks about interoception, which is the in, how your body feels. And so when you think about how does your stomach feel, how do your shoulders, your brain, your heart. And so trying to get um, your child to understand what your their body feels like when they are comfortable. And then versus uncomfortable, like maybe you're at the doctor and your shoulders are up and you're clenching your fists and you are not comfortable, you know, so they can understand when they have bound what their boundaries are and when they are comfortable versus uncomfortable. And communicating boundaries protects us from being taken advantage of and lets other people know how you like to be treated. And so we talk about in pictures you know, they're standing apart, so they're not too close. They're probably classmates. Here, they're looking at each other, and they're smiling. They're comfortable with each other. You know, t t talking about what, how they, reading body language and all the different ways that you can read um, pictures. You know, you can do this with, you know, taking pictures or pictures at, you know, that you have at home. You know, show these people are comfortable. Here's a healthy relationship. They have healthy boundaries. And just showing, showing them, you know, real life instances that you have with your pictures at home. And then digital boundaries. You know, and we, we, we always talk about how um, everything on, that you share or that goes on any device is public. If you don't want mom, you don't want, your grandma, you don't want it in the local newspaper, don't put it online. So one of the topics we talk about is gender. We just talk about facts, gender identity. We talk about is your brain, how you think about yourself, how you identify your biological sex. Either you have female sexual parts or male sexual parts. Gender expression is how you show your gender, the way you act, dress, behave, and interact with others. And sexual orientation is who you're attracted to romantically, emotionally, and sexually. Then when we cut co when covering public versus private, public is a place where people can go in and out, and there's certain ways we behave, touch and talk when in a public place. And we always show like your backyard, your kitchen, um, you know, obviously the grocery store, maybe McDonald's, but we always show a park because sometimes you might be the only ones at the park, but it's still a public place because people can go in and out. And there are certain, and again, there's certain behaviors that are expected. And then private places, 
or where you can close and lock a door and no one comes in without your permission or consent. And we say it is your bedroom and your bathroom, as long as you're not sharing your bedroom um, with someone. And in private, we may do or share things in a more intimate place. For internet safety and pornography, we explore, it's important to explore positive and negative parts of social media. You know, it's a huge part of our lives. So they're, you know, it's something they need to know. They're going to hear other people talking about it. So what is appropriate to share online? Examine ways to be safe online. Like what are your boundaries for your family? Um, and then pornography, what is legal, what is illegal, and what a lot of um, people with IDD have trouble with is why is it illegal? Um, so the two websites that we recommend are netsmarts.org and the missingkids.org education. They're both run by the National um, Center for Missing and Exploited Children. They have great videos. One of the videos is your photo fate, and it shows what happens if you send an image to someone and you think they're a good friend or a boyfriend or girlfriend, and then what could happen to it and how many people could potentially see it. So why might your child engage online? Some, they might have a lack of peers or a friend group to learn and share experiences. So they get online and they try and find their group. Um, maybe they're curious about topics. They haven't had conversations or maybe they heard something and they want to, you know, oh, I'm going to look it up um, instead of asking. And they could end up in unsafe places on the internet. Maybe they're unsure of safe people to talk to and ask questions about online safety um, or pornography or relationships and sex education. So it's important for you to be available or know someone who they can talk to. If you're not comfortable doing it, you're, we're happy to answer questions or help you answer those questions. Um, and what we've heard from a lot of people with IDD is that online friends groups offer kind of this safe haven. You know, this is where they start to get in trouble because they get into these conversations or they get into these groups while they're playing Roblox or various, you know, online games. And nobody has to worry about, you know, oh, everyone says I have to have eye contact or, you know, I don't have to worry about reading the body language or being in a large group or worrying about my sensory needs. And, you know, online groups, those people are, you know, they target people and they're accepting of others and not always safe. And so pornography, if it has images of people 18 and older, that is legal. What is illegal is child pornography. And so let's all internet providers, Microsoft, Google, Yahoo, all of those are required by law to report online viewing of pornographic images of children. So if somebody is on your computer and they accidentally, you know, those pop-up windows come up and they click on it, it's recorded. Now, if it, they record and if, the person shuts the computer real quick or tell your child tells you, oh my gosh, this was, you know, I can't believe I did this or help me. That's okay. But if they start looking at it um, more than one time, we actually have someone in our class looked at child porn twice 
and is now entangled with the criminal justice system. Um, so law enforcement is notified. So we are in touch with a Fairfax County police officer who has recommend BARC. Um, it's not perfect, nothing is perfect, but BARC seems to be um, one of the apps or one of, there's a, an app and a phone, a BARC phone. Um, this is the website. It tells you all about how it can help you, you know, monitor what's going on on their phone, on their screens, and different things like that. There is a Facebook page that is called Parenting in a Tech World. And one of the, the I think it's the parent um, advisor to Bark runs the runs the Facebook page and sh people are constantly asking questions about games and apps and all the different things. And, you know, I've learned a lot on there. <laughs> it's very overwhelming sometimes, but it can give you a lot of information about how kids sometimes try and backdoor some of the ways that you try and turn off or that they you are monitoring their um, screen time. So when talking about body parts and caring for your bodies, it's important to describe the sexual and reproductive parts, the exploring the body changes during puberty. And again, with just facts, um, what is menstruation and ejaculation, describing what sexual parts are used for. So we there's three functions. We say it's to have a baby, to um, go to the bathroom and for sexual pleasure. Um, and then we explore ways to keep sexual parts healthy, talking about going to the doctor, self exams, um, and then discussing that ever lovely hygiene piece when they become, when they start going through puberty. When talking about dating and relationships, Talking about communication, how do you communicate? How, you know, using words, using your device, using body language, you know, how do you read all that information? How will you communicate? You know, where and how to meet safely. We talk about, you, you know, have a thing at home that if you are going to meet a date, you need to video, we say video date first, so you know the person's real. Um, you know, make sure that a parent takes you there so they know they meet the person, they know who the person is you're going to be meeting. Um, make sure you have an out. You know, we talk about first dates, what to consider. Love on the Spectrum has a really, really cute first date video. Um, a guy brings uh, one of the uh, girl to a park and they play they have a picnic and it's very romantic and it's a great way to show what a good first date might look like. And her mom brings her to the first date. Um, we talking about linger, lurking and stalking because that a lot of times, you know, those are social cues that they're not, uh, that our students may not understand and your children may not understand. And that can also get them into trouble. We talk about um, when you want to contact someone, if you like someone and you might want to contact them and ask them out, that you only three times and you're done. First time you do it, you contact them and you say, hey, you want to go out? You don't get an answer. Okay, maybe they lost the text. Wait a couple of days, you can answer, ask again, no answer. If by the third time they're not answering you, that's it, you're done, no more. Um, we talk about crush, love, and lust. Crush is usually one-sided unless there's content, uh, cons consent. We talk about how to disagree and compromise. And then 
eventually if you decide to date the person or should I not date the person? Should I stay or should I go? And then we talk about sexual feelings. Sexual feelings are not a choice. So when you go through puberty, sexual feelings are normal and healthy. And as it says, it's okay to feel your feelings, right? Sexual feelings are not a choice, but you have four choices when you have those feelings. Um, and this is what we talk about. Like if you're in school and you are, you know, having an erection, what could you do? You know, talk about it ahead of time before they're going through puberty, before it may happen, you know, bring that big sweatshirt to school, you know, ask to go to the bathroom so you're not embarrassed, you know, things like that. Um, let me, so you can ignore the feelings, you can acknowledge the feelings in your head, but try and distract yourself, keep them private and distract yourself. And if you are in private, you can self-pleasure or masturbate, or if you're in a relationship, then you can, with consent, you and your partner can decide if you want to act on those feelings. And here we go. So getting towards this, so how do you answer these questions, right? Oh my gosh, my child comes to me. How can I answer them? So we have two ways for you to answer them. Um, teachable moments help you answer factual questions. How, what is a condom? How are babies made? So first, what you would do is take a deep breath and say, okay, I'm glad you asked. It's good that you're asking these questions. And then you clarify, why are you asking? Where did you hear this, right? Remember the whole Syracuse and where did you come from? This is where you want to clarify, where did you hear this? Um, choose the message you want to give, go positive using that medical terminology and short and sweet. So if the, your child says, how are babies made? You say, okay, this is the short answer. If an egg and sperm meet, a pregnancy may occur. That may be enough. They're done. You're good. But if they're really curious, then if they're curious, you can go into more detail. Right. But then and then you also need to then be prepared. You know, what is a uterus? What are the fallopian tubes do? What are the ovaries? How big are eggs? You know, all those questions come about, which is great. And you can say, you know what? I would love to answer those questions, but I need a little bit of time before I answer them. And you can email us at ease and we can help you or just, you know, you can look them up on the internet and help them um, understand what those words are and then ask for feedback, right? Did this answer your question? Are you, no, yes. Okay, great. And then do you have any more questions? So that's one way. The second way is called the Scarborough Method developed by Winifred Kempton. And it helps you include additional information without having to, you know, think, oh my gosh, how do I do this? It kind of organizes it for you. So the three aspects are physical. What is it? You know, what describe it? The social piece, is it public private? Is it resp what responsibility comes with, with it? Are there laws that are connected to it? And then the emotional piece, what are feelings they might have that are connected? So for example, if they said, what's a condom? So you would say, physically, it is made of latex and covers an erect penis with an opening at one end like a sock. Simple, easy. Um, I mean, you can go into, there's different colors and sizes and you know however detailed you want to get. Um, Socially, using a condom is private. It protects you and your partner from pregnancy and or 
um, sexually transmitted infections. And emotionally, many people feel good when they use condoms. They feel they're acting responsibly and don't have to worry about pregnancy and STIs. So those are two ways that you can answer answer questions that your child has without having to, you know, totally figure out how do I put this in order? How do I answer this question? So the next couple slides, we're almost done, are um, resources. So this book, and I have it right here, is um, about uh, behaviors. And so it says it's a professional's guide to understanding, preventing issues, supporting sexuality, and responding to inappropriate behaviors. Um, but it has social stories in here. It has all sorts of great resources and pictures. Um, you know, it talks about wet dreams. And there's a whole social story on wet dreams, on what it is, what might happen, and then what you need to do to clean up afterwards. So there's all sorts of great information in this book. Um, this is, this example is maybe something a child is masturbating in public. So what's the function of the behavior? Was there a change in routine? Do they have knowledge of sex and relationships or what, what's supposed to happen? Did something in the environment change? Maybe they're doing it because their medication or medical condition is occurring. Um, or maybe they're not releasing if they're masturbating and they're just frustrated. So there's it helps you think through things and you know what might occur and what might be the function of the behavior. Then there, um, these are all books. It's perfectly normal. It's a little older. It has cartoons in it, but it also has very simple language for you to be able to share um, and it gives you the words on how to explain different um, aspects of growing up um, with puberty and sex and gender and sexual health. The Boyfriends and Girlfriends Guide to Dating gives checklists, like very big wor words, checklists on, you know, how do, what do I need to know on about a first date? You know, it talks about flirting. It talks about um, crush, love, talks about all those things in very simple, easy to read language. Um, autism, spectrum, sexuality, and the law. Uh, unfortunately, um, in our classes, we have had um, people with autism in trouble with the law because they misinterpret um, social cues. They go, they're stalking people, or they get in trouble with child pornography. Um, and so, this is a book about a father whose son got in trouble with the law. And what someone with autism may incur. Right now in Virginia, if you have if you are arrested and you are going to be sentenced, your autism can be taken into consideration uh, with sentencing, um, which is huge for Virginia, but Obviously, we have a long way to go. Um, Tell Me is a book. Here, it's like this. It goes, flips up. It's like a good bathroom book. Um, one of the, they have different questions. This one is, why do you get, why do you get pimples? And then you flip it up. And on the next page, it gives you like a quick answer. And then this one, is it weird going through puberty? And again, it gives you a quick answer. Good pictures and bad pictures talks about pornography and what it does to your brain. And this book, it says teaching children and teaching children with Down syndrome about their bodies, boundaries, and sexuality. And that is um, 
it's for everyone, not just for children and not just for children with Down syndrome. Arlene, we have a question in the chat. Of, can you recommend any books explaining LGBTQIA plus to give people the language and terminology? So there are, a, there's the Trevor Project. If you've looked up the Trevor Project, um, there are, Scarletine is actually a website that has resources and information on everything. We, we call it like the old 17 magazine. Um, it has very simple information. It has a, um, what do you call it? A glossary for all sorts of information on um, LGBTQ and all that, all those um definitions and all the new um, sexual orientation. And if you want more resources for that, you can email us and our email will be coming up in a second. Um, Amaze also has really good videos, actually their LGBTQ and sexual identity and orientation videos are actually decent. Um, this awk talk is what it is, you know, awkward talk, type in a question about sex or puberty, and it comes up with a very simple answer. Um, there is NCIL is the National Council for Independent Living, and they have different videos with people with IDD who talk about consent. One of them is showing how to put on a condom. One talks about what a healthy relationship looks like. If you have young children, sexedrescue.com, highly recommend. She is, um, Kath Hackinson, is located in Australia, but her website has books upon books upon books and resources and websites about how to have conversations with young children um, about all the all different um, aspects of sex. She, if you if you um, decide to get her newsletter, she talks about hilarious conversations she has with her children. Um, and how she had to overcome some of the conversations, but such good information for young elementary age kids. Uh, PlannedParenthood.org has a bot named called Rue. Again, it's similar to OpTalk. You type in a question and up pops a simple answer. The MissingKids.org um, is about the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children was on the previous uh, slide that I had shown. Defending Young Minds also talks about how to talk about porn and different um, online things with kids, young kids and has a lot of great information. LRID is the legal reform for people with IDD, if for any reason you need, you know, your child becomes entangled with the law because of a sex, something with sex or online um, child pornography or anything, that is where you need to go. Um, he knows all the lawyers and all the right people for your child um, to get the best help and support they can. And then uh, the last one, I'm going to plug something <laughs> for a friend of mine, um, IPS Trade School. If you have somebody who is looking for almost ready to graduate from high school and you are looking for a trade for them to do, they are doing carpentry and woodworking. So I help them with the pilot program, um, but it's a great local um trade school that is up and coming. It's inclusive pathways to success. And if you need research and you want, if you're the research type person, um, there's a Harvard 
article that says sex ed that goes beyond sex says you should teach about relationships, not just about sex. Um, there are myths and facts from advocatesforyouth.org. And here's an article on from NIH. So a little bit about ease real quick. We teach 16 week online courses for adults, which is 18 and up with one parent meeting to, and then a 12 week online course for teens with two parent meetings, which we talk about how to best support your child through the class. We do staff trainings, parent workshops, group home and individual supports, personalized one-to-one -one sessions, support for jail deferral, and we've done some professional development. Um, and we're starting to get in with Fairfax County admin um, to try and get more information on, you know, getting more comprehensive sex ed and relationship information into the school system. Then at the classes, we use music. We do a very routine each week. We review every week. We do video clips, handouts after every class, discussion and scenarios, visuals, interactive teaching, consistent structure. There's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer support and laughter. Then we have a blue slide, that's a wrap up, and resources. And thank you for having me. And here's our blue slide. <laughs> it's our wrap up. So if you need to get in touch with us, our website is www.easeeducates.org and it's two E's next to each other. And same with our email, easeeducates at gmail.com. If you have any other questions, please let, uh, let me know. Thank you so much for this presentation, Arlene. This is such important information for our students. And as you said at the beginning, students with intellectual and developmental disabilities are often left out of these conversations. Um, so it's this has been fantastic. I really appreciate it. I'm taking a look in the chat. Um, there was a question of what was the link for the trade school at the end? Oh. Sure. IPSTradeSchool.org. Do we have any other questions in the audience for Arlene? And it was a very thoughtful and very thorough presentation. I really appreciate um, everything you do to Absolutely. put this together. Um, I have a I have a question as a as a parent of a minimally speaking child. Um, do your classes or resources for adults, you know, address students whose communication needs are that complex? Yes. So we are actually teaching um, at a school online at a school in Brooklyn, and almost all of the students are non speaking or use a device. And so we um, have created materials for them that have all this information, but with more visuals and less words so that they're able to um, understand it. And then we try and work with each individual on the best way they communicate so that we can help them be able to communicate their boundaries and their and consent. Like those are the most important things that we want to make sure that they're able to do that. So we work with each individual to make sure that they have the best way for them to communicate that. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, we have had a couple of other questions come in. Um, somebody was looking for the link at the beginning from CSIS, S-I-E-C-U-S. Yeah, let's see. There we go. If you want to, is it possible for you to share? Would you be okay with sharing the slides with us? Sure. Yeah, it, I I can definitely do that. I can send okay. them to you. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. That would be great. And we can send them out um to the attendees. That's really sure. awesome. Thank you. And 
All right. How would you approach a child who's embarrassed after the FLE, the family life education at school and doesn't want to talk about the issues? Um, that would probably depend on the age of the child, you know, taking small pieces and maybe, you know, it depends upon what they're embarrassed about. Is it the sex piece or the, you know, the body development, maybe leaving information, showing them, you know, leaving books like that tell me book around and, um, you know, giving, giving them that information, maybe asking, you know, do you have any questions? You know, it's, it's okay if they're embarrassed, you know, it, it's kind of developmental as well. You know, having those conversations are uncomfortable for kids, um, but they need to be heard. You know, it does, I think we think it's very important and research says, you know, you need to talk about it as early as possible. You know, you may not go into as much detail with someone who's younger, but wouldn't you rather them hear it from you than hear it from someone else? You know, so sometimes you kind of have to pull the parent card and be like, okay, we're going to have this conversation now. And, um, you know, let's talk a little now. Let's wait. We'll talk a little more later. So. Did that answer your question, Stephanie? A little it did yeah that's what we did um i was just trying to find a way to make it more um less oh no here come here it comes again it's more yeah. like <laughs> the puberty talk but it, it just a room full of laughing boys didn't didn't go over well um so yeah, yeah that's what we kind of what we've been doing we've got a few of the books and have the you're going to have to do this now and then you can go do what you want. <laughs> right, exactly. Or as Michelle said, get him in the car, take a little ride. <laughs> oh yes, that he yeah, it's the the eye roll amount that's coming at me on with the word puberty is hilarious. So, yeah. <laughs> and just as an added piece of information um for those who may be listening or not aware um there is adapted um, family life education materials in Fairfax County. They do, just as they do with the general education curriculum, give a presentation on that at the school admin, gives a presentation on that at the beginning of the year for families. You can ask for a recording of that since many of those are now being virtual. Um, you can ask for a recording of that if you cannot attend. Um, so know that that resource is there as well so that you can see what your child is seeing at school if you are opting them into that curriculum. Let's see. Are ease classes single gender or mixed? They are mixed both at the teen teenage level and at the adult level. Um, we have had one all female class. Uh, there were five there happened to be five friends who asked if they could do one together and we accommodated them. But otherwise, we have all mixed um, gender, and it seems to be okay. We teach everything, so everyone's getting all the same information. Okay. I do not see, oh, Diane? I just, I just wanted to thank you. I think this is a fantastic presentation, and it's so important. And I think one thing that often happens to our ID and, and, and DD populations are that they're infantilized, you know, pretty much all the way through their lives. And that is so um, insulting and, and painful. And I think that sometimes as parents, you know, I know myself, I'm so in the role of protector and I've been doing it for so long that it's hard to step back and say, regardless of whatever challenges the child might have, like they are becoming an adult and they have the same adult desires and thoughts that any other adult has. And I think that's, it's, um, as parents, sometimes we have to do our own work to be okay with that. And it's scary too. And I think that, that acknowledging that, um, that, you know, 
like you said earlier, I think the biological changes are happening. So, you know, it, it's, that's the reality and they will experiment and they will look to someone for information if we don't provide it. I just think that that is so important. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Yes, I will echo that as well. I mean, we talk all the time about the need to presume the confidence of our students and it's often referred to academically, but it's oh so important socially and relationally as well. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for this presentation. We are very thankful that you were able to come and share this with us tonight. Um, I do not see any other questions um, okay. for you. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you for we'll having me. After. Okay. Uh, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. You too.